welcome to the show. I'm Jenna Morton. And I'm Tosh Taylor. And today, all the way from Toronto, we're welcoming our guest. This is the cool part about Zoom, right? Is that we can actually bring people in from all across the country, which is fantastic. So today we're getting a chance to interview a a top-selling author. His name is David Giffen, and David is the author of Redemptive Trauma, Confessions of a Defrocked Priest. And David, uh, first of all, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. And I can't wait to get into your story because the book is absolutely incredible. And I have such a hard time in your short period of life to believe you've done all these things already. (laughs) (laughs) It's been been a wild ride for sure. It's been a wild ride. Absolutely. So uh, maybe let's kind of start in not like, you know, the birth of David, we don't, we don't need to start with the birth of David, but like, how did you parting and, you know, yeah, Yeah. exactly. But how did you end up going from where you were? Let's explain to people where you were to where you then decided you were going to become a priest. Oh man. Okay. So, um, grew up in a, in a, in a pretty religious family, religious immigrant family where, you know, I was going to go to mass all the time with my mom, but I spent most of my teenage years uh, doing everything I could to convince the world that, uh, that I should never become a priest. Um, right. Like, uh, I would rather have had that perception of myself at that, at that particular part of my life. It was, a, certainly a rebellion against family and a rebellion against the faith of my family, um, but uh, as as I as I write in one of the chapters of my book, I had a pretty big crash um, when I was uh, 20, 21 years old, um, having abused drugs and alcohol, having really uh, struggled in a whole bunch of different ways, mental health issues. Um, uh, in the middle of the night, one night, I crashed a car into a house. And when I say uh, when I say the, a big crash, right, like there's no getting around, uh, you know having to have a long, hard look at your life at that point. And, you know, I was saying to someone recently that uh, how did I become a priest from that situation, right? Like, that doesn't make sense that, you know, you go from that situation to 21, 22 or 20, 20, 21 to 25, 26, you're, you're serving as a parish priest. Um, and I think one of the big things, you know, in retrospect, looking back in hindsight, it's 2020, right? But um I wanted to make right uh, a lot of the wrongs that I had made very wrong. And uh, with the upbringing I had had and the kind of cultural framework that I saw. um, And, you know, the truth is, I I, even in the midst of it all, even though I I didn't I didn't want to belong to the family I belong to or belong to the church I belong to. There was still something uh, that resonated with me about, you know, a God of grace and mercy who, um, you know, reaches out down into the gutters and the trenches and and, and pulls out those who are reaching up for him. Um, So it it made sense in some ways that that I landed in a in a in a role that served the community. Um, I think I shocked pretty much everyone in my life when uh, when I kneeled before the bishop and uh, was ordained a priest. It's just absolutely fascinating to think how short of time period you're talking about there, that, that things change so drastically in your life. What, what was that like? Well, I think the truth is that's the, the kind of pivot has been the reason, you know, you, you ask how have I done all these different things in my life, Tosh was asking before. Um, I think I pivot quickly, right? Like I think um, when when things have blown up in my life, whether it's because I've blown them up or it's, you know, you know, external forces have blown them up. Um, I really, uh, my, my kind of way of being is to, to just plant a foot and go in a new direction. Um, and, um, like I said, it's, it's not like I had never been, uh, been exposed to church or religion or any of those things at that at that point, I certainly had a had an interest and an experience in it all, um, but you know the a, a lot of the time I was I was fortunate that that some of the the clergy I knew uh, growing up um, were really wonderful people, and when I look back again, hindsight, um, if you know I was facing some dark moments and I thought about who do I want to become, you know, some of them would have been some of the first people who who would have popped in my mind because they were the kinds of people who. I knew cared for, you know, the vulnerable and the sick and the lonely and people like that. So 
when you when you find yourself isolated like that and you start to think okay you know where am i going to go who, you know who am i going to spend time with and who do i want to be um they certainly were people i thought of when you like thinking back on it now growing up do you think that you always thought that you would have some sort of career helping other people Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I can say that's true. I think there were certainly periods where I, I would have been inclined that way. Um, you know, my mom was always, a, a you know, someone who, who worked in the community, often at churches, things like that. Um, so I, I was exposed to that, that kind of way of being a lot. I think, you know, in a, some of my formative years, this is just the truth, in my teenage years, I didn't know if I'd be alive by 20. I was just, I was, I was drinking so much and getting into fights and I, I, I wasn't thinking, you know, <laughs> how am I, how am I going to do well by the world? That, that's just not, that, that's really not what I was asking myself. Um, most of it was, you know, who's going to buy me beers on Friday. Um, and, you know, like, uh, I think, I really do think that, 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 that pivot as, as, as things got pretty dark in my early twenties, and really realizing what a mess I'd made, right? Like, and you, you realize that, you know, I was very fortunate no one was hurt in that accident. Um, would it, my whole life would be completely different if someone was. But, um, you know, you, I, I think there are times, there are pivot moments. And I, you know, I, work, with, I work with clients in, uh, in, in a medical clinic now. And, you know, I see it in their lives too, where, where there are moments where you do have a chance to, 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 you know, put a foot down and pivot into a new direction. Um, or you can just barrel forward and, you know, hit the wall a little harder. You're not going to get, go anywhere, but you know, you can hit the wall harder if you want. Do you ever think back and, and look at, you know, who you were when you were struggling as a teenager and a young adult and, and kind of wonder, you know, if you had come across yourself, how would you, how could you have reached out? How could you have helped yourself? Could you have done anything before that, you know, final push? Well, my first reaction was to say I would have slapped him silly, but then I realized, you know, that the, the everything that happened at the Oscars this past weekend, we probably should, shouldn't be making those jokes anymore. Um, so no, I wouldn't have slapped myself silly because we're, you know, that's not a good idea. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, the truth is. Uh, for a lot of uh, young people who are, are struggling the way I was, um, it's connection that they need, right? Like it's an unauthentic, uh, non-drug or alcohol induced, which is usually not a real connection, Connection, right? Like, um, yeah, I, I needed, if I look back now and, and I think who I, could, who I would be to myself going back, it would be someone to put, put my arm around that kid and say, you know, you don't, have, you don't have to do this to get attention. There are other ways to get attention. Um, if, you, if you're hurt or if you're struggling if, or if you're angry or sad, there, there, there are things we can do together to, you know, to find a way forward that doesn't include you destroying yourself. Yeah. And do you think you would have listened? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, the tricky part of it stubborn. all, right? Like, I'm pretty stubborn. So um, no, my, my way of learning is to take my lumps, to learn from experience and, you know, and, and, you know, that is what it is, right? Everybody learns differently. Um, I happen to be somebody who learns the hard way usually. And that kind of takes us to the next step. The, the title of the book is Confessions of a Defrocked Priest. So there's clearly more to the story uh, as, as we go on. So what you become a priest, what happens next? Well, I served three, uh, three different churches in the Anglican Church of Canada. Um, I started um, as uh, the assistant curate or what's that's the formal title. So like the, the learning priest on staff with the more senior priest on there at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, Ontario, which is an old, venerable, beautiful uh, cathedral seats, like 1200 people. Um, and they have a wonderful, wonderful food program serving, I don't know, hundred, hundred meals a day. Um, and so I got to, I got to hang out there for a while. Um, I, it was a pretty cool experience that um, the, the senior priest on staff was elected Bishop. And so at 28, um, I was asked to be in charge of the cathedral for the interim period. So I was, I was the youngest priest in charge of a cathedral at the time um, in all of the Anglican communion around, around the world. So that was kind of cool. I got invited uh, to North Toronto uh, to take over a parish that only had like 15 people left in it and uh, try and revitalize the place. 
Um, and we built programs like the little lo- little lambs drop in on Fridays for moms and nannies and dads and tots, just free programming. You know, we'd bring in uh, musicians, we'd bring in pets and we bring in all this, you know, give people a break from the isolation they're experiencing in their homes. Um, started new communities. It's, it's, it's a really vibrant place now, right at, uh, right at Young and Eglinton in Toronto. Um, and uh, after that, I, uh, my final appointment uh, as a priest, my last 18 months was uh, at the downtown parish, uh, pretty close to the Royal Ontario Museum, a uh, uh, place known for its innovation and programming and uh, social outreach, uh, you know, heavily involved with uh, uh, with the city of Toronto, uh, with the with issues around uh, joblessness and homelessness and uh, housing, um, and yeah, it was an incredible privilege to serve all those communities. Um, incredible people leading those places. Okay, and but then, you want to know how that ended? I do. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we can let people yes. read the book. <laughs> yeah, no, and I'm happy for them to read the book. I hope that I hope this gives some plugs for it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, uh, I fractured my ankle in three places two weeks before I started that final, uh, final spot. Um, and I had kind of learned growing up that, uh, you know, suck it up and dig in was, was the best way to approach, um, problems, right? Like, um, even with all the, the pivots I'd made in life. And sometimes to be honest with you, the way I got through some of the pivots was to suck it up and dig in, right? Like um, it had served me in survival mode quite well for a long time. But in this situation, um, I found myself abusing opioids for the next year and a half. Um, I did need them for when you fracture an ankle in three places, you do need pain relief. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I did like lots of people do. But what I found was after a few months, um, although I refused to admit I didn't need the pain really for the ankle, um, it had been, the opioids had been treating a a spiritual and a historic and an emotional pain about, you know, traumatic memories around things around abuse. And um, all of a sudden I couldn't be without those drugs, right? Like I, I, I needed them and I was willing to lie. I was willing to, you know, deceive other people. And you start to find, uh, as you depend on using drugs for those kinds of reasons, you find yourself isolated, making compromise decisions. Um, And uh, towards the end of my time, I I entered into a relationship with someone who was uh, under my authority as priest. Um, And um, my license was pulled and I was given the boot, Um, and rightly so. And so where does the pivot go from that? How do you get from there to today? Yeah, you know, um, uh, a, a lot of tears and heartache and, 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 and frustration uh, for quite a while, right? Like I, at the time I had a four-year-old, um, my, my ex-wife and I had just uh, split up at the time. So it was, you know, it was a, it was a hard run there um, for a while. You're losing your career, your marriage has just ended. All of a sudden you're not living with, you know, the, the person you love most in the world, your, your little boy. Um, so I spent it, uh, I spent kind of some time in the wilderness is what I refer to it as, um, or as some of my, my old friends say, I, I spent my late thirties reclaiming my twenties. Um, I, uh, I needed some time, uh, apart from the church, apart from my family, uh, not from my son. I still spent lots of time with my son, but uh, I was having an identity crisis in a lot of ways, right? Like, uh, I'd spent a decade celebrating mass five times a week, right? Like um, having spent my life prior to that, not celebrating mass five times a week. Um, So trying to figure out how to integrate these different parts of who I was and who I'd been and decisions I'd made and who I believed myself to be, who others believed me to be. Um, So I took some intentional time, a couple of years actually, um, to to really uh, try and figure out, you know, who David Giffen was going to be for the second half of life. Because um, as I've commented a few times, my book feels like a eulogy to the first half of my life, Um, right? It's, uh, uh, I was closing a door on a chapter um, that would fundamentally change, you know, how I would live going forward. Um, And so uh, it took some some really good intentional time. And as I tell clients today, you know, if you're coming to that pit, it's not how fast you get out of the pivot, right? Like it's how it, it's 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 whether you get in the right in the right lane on the next step, right? Like 
Um, and so I really, I, you know, I certainly put my foot down and started to move, but um, I wasn't sure where I was going to go. So it took me a little while. And then like that imagery you used. Oh, sorry, Tom. Okay. <laughs> I, just, okay. I love that idea of like, you got to put your foot down, but it, that doesn't mean that you need to jump into the next thing quickly. Take the time to figure out where that, that foot's going to go. And I just it, I think the idea of identity crisis is something that we haven't all talked about enough as a society, because I think, you know, certainly I've gone through not quite the same, but a similar, like, I remember looking in the mirror when I turned 35 and being like, who is this person who is a 35 year old mother of three who no longer has this career that had defined my twenties and right. Like it's that same kind of, you have to have those moments of checking in and figuring out, yeah, who the world sees and who you want them to see and who you see. I think I said in my book somewhere that I, I think we all enter into these moments where it really matters that we ask the question, who, both who we are and whose we are, right? Like, um, who do I belong to and who I am? Um, and uh, yeah, no, I, for anybody who takes like mental health leave, um, and I think more people should be encouraged to and not be afraid of doing that kind of thing, but not a rush to get out of it, right? Like, you know, a a genuine step into a, into a place where you are safe to, you know, to work on your head a little bit, right? Like, um, and to not rush out of it or to rush in a new direction or to have all the answers to how this is all going to get figured out on the other side, but to rest, uh, to spend time with people who love you for, for you, not the things you've accomplished, right? Like the you, you, um, and, uh, and usually a really good therapist, <laughs> which I've been fortunate to have in my life. Now, when you decided to write the book, do you think like when you initially sat down and started writing, was it for you? Like you never intended for this to, to actually turn into a best-selling novel, but that's amazing that it did. Right. Yeah. So the, the, uh... I, I joke that I wrote it over, you know, 39 years because like it really like it's, you know, when you write a memoir, that's that's what it is. Right. Like so, and parts of the writing are actually 25 years old. Right. Like they've been adapted and, you know, um, like there was some poetry I wrote that got that ended up in there that it was written when I was like 16 years old. So it's, it, you know, there, there's stuff in there from a long time. It was the summer of 2020 when I really sat down to write the book. Um, it was, you know, we were in lockdown. Um, you know, the pandemic was, you know, it was real by that point, right? By the summer when, you know, those first few months, you kind of thought, oh, this, this isn't going to last forever. And then by July, it's like, oh, my God, this is going to last forever. Um, and so uh, I, was, I was living with uh, one of my oldest friends. Uh, I, uh, he has this big, huge open, open air rooftop on his house. And so I, uh, I, I went up there for most of July, 2020, um, every single day and, uh, and, and wrestled with myself. And I suppose uh, you could say I wrestled with God, right? Like that's, uh, that's what I was doing was, I was, it was the kind of the end, coming to the end of those, those couple of years after leaving active ministry and trying to really make, when I talk about integrating and, and figure out that identity piece, you know, I was, I was, I was writing my own narrative. So I could, so I could understand, first of all, you know, how I ended up here. <laughs> um, and uh, when I shared it with a, a former colleague who I will be eternally grateful for, his name's on the front of my book, Murray Watson, he was my editor. Um, I showed it to him and uh, he spent the next six weeks with me um, just uh, digging into it. And as I've said before, um, ha often having the audacity to tell me I was wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, I will always be grateful for Murray. So it took, it took a couple of months writing it itself was, was, was really just, you know, it was all in my head, in my head. Right. So it just, it, I just needed to sit and let it all come out. The editing was a di was a different piece, uh, but it was a couple of months in 2020. Excellent, excellent. So then uh, you you write the book, and I'm just gonna, and then the pandemic ends, 
<laughs> and you, yeah, we all know that that was sarcasm, right? Okay. So um, <laughs> <laughs> just in case you couldn't see Tasha's face yeah. there. I was, yeah. I was like, is it, did it end in New Brunswick? Because no, it hasn't no, ended. No, no. <laughs> uh, you but, see, we're on Zoom, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> But you you have taken this, all of this, and you have moved it into an absolutely amazing career working with people who were once you. Yeah, really. Like that is that's a great definition of my job is that I, I get I get to go put on put on the boots of those who are still, you know, not to say I'm not still in the mud, but you know, we get into the trench together. Um from some of my work with 403 Leadership Collective, where you know I work with organizations and uh, and and you know different kinds of leaders um, as they try and plot a course out of one place to another. Um, but so I think my most important work is in rapid access addiction medicine, where I work in a in a mobile clinic in three spots: Mississauga, Branton, and Orangeville, um, and. Um, I'm a, I, I'm a frontline worker, healthcare worker, um, where I, I get to, to be on the ground with people who um, are at a level of addiction that often um, there is no way out without medical assistance. Um, and uh, my job uh, in peer support alongside them is, uh, is, is to be somebody who they can know, understands what it is to be addicted, what it is to suffer, um, what it is to be alone, um, and maybe uh, help carry uh, the burden a little bit for a little while. Um, so it's it's probably I'll look back. I imagine, and you know, I hope I do this for a long time. But it'll be the greatest privilege of my life. Yeah, I think that seems like the perfect place to. I won't say end, I'll say pause this because I, I, I think that uh, we will revisit this sometime in the future, but we do have a limited amount of time today, unfortunately. So before we let you go, David, can you let everyone know how they can, you know, access your book, uh, find out more about the work that you're doing and, and really kind of uh, take some of this away with them? Absolutely. So uh, if you want to find me uh, with my business, 403 Leadership Collective, uh, www.403lc.com, coaching, workshops, retreats, uh, you find a little bit about the book there. But if you want to buy the book, it's available on Amazon, Chapters Indigo, uh, Bookshop, uh, pretty much anywhere you can find a book. Uh, it's not on shelves everywhere, but you can definitely find it online. Amazing. I just, I, I truly do think that what you are turning your life into is absolutely remarkable. And I hope that you keep sharing and you keep helping people because that's obviously what you've been meant to do. Thank you. And uh, it's a real, uh, real pleasure to spend some time chatting with you guys this morning. Thanks so much, David.